Live. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. How are you? How are you doing, Scott? I'm I am good. Just uh, trying to keep up with everything that's going on. Uh, it's an exciting time for Offshore Explorer. Um, we've had a really, really great response for Captain Tim's uh, uh, interview. Um, lots of people were very happy to get uh, get the information and the one thing that's funny about it is is that a lot of guys have sent me messages um, on some of the stuff that Tim has said and one of them was um, give him a call and what he meant by that was uh, it never occurred to guys on a sailboat to get on the VHF radio dial up channel 16 or channel 13 and in new york harbor they use 13 for most of the tugboats but 16 is the international hail uh hailing channel so they would be able to hear you and answer you and say hey um i'm this sailboat off of your port bow (laughs) it's like where am i supposed to go so you don't run me over yeah, yeah, you don't want that to happen. <laughs> and, and and because you know the guy driving the boat is got his eye on you, and he doesn't want to run you over, and he will make some course corrections to accommodate you. But it all comes down to the, the concept of physics. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're moving 30,000 barrels of oil on a barge downriver with a current, yeah, it's a kind of... Uh, it's a dicey it's a dicey job it's not going to stop on a dime yeah yeah i can imagine it's probably not as easy to maneuver when you're maneuvering one of those big big barges well that was the other thing that we talked about too was as um you know because there's different kinds of tugboats and and it, the kind of tugboat that are like the push tugboats which he has or push they push and tow but uh, they just have a prop and two uh two rudders so uh, that's very similar to uh, what you would have on a sailboat or a power boat. Okay, you would have two props, uh, two rudders, or two one prop, one rudder. So anyway, kind of a combination where all your power and steering is together at the stern of the boat. And we talked about uh, the differences in the way a boat handles when you get into shallow water as opposed to uh, being in deeper water and trying to maneuver. And anybody that's brought their sailboat into the slip and and is going slow and they put power and the boat's moving all over the place and they can't, you know, the, it just becomes a disaster because they don't have any control of the boat. And for most people, the idea is to go to the power first, then the steering. And, uh, but when you really want to make a boat work you take the prop out of the equation once the boat is moving water is running over the rudder that's your control you just use the prop to pump you up a little bit to just move you just to keep your momentum going but it's 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 basically all in the rudder and placing it in a certain spot and it's something that we didn't talk about but I can talk about today is if you really want to do some finite maneuvering, all right, rather than hitting the power, then turning the wheel in the direction you want it to go, it's better to turn the wheel first, set the wheel up, and then give it power. That way the prop is pushing against the rudder that's already turned. So it goes like this. So the thrust goes out that way, and that way the boat will move this way, or it will come that way, depending if it's forward or reverse. Yeah. That sounds complicated, but a lot of guys make the mistake of they're turning their wheels. They're going like a tenth of a knot, and they're turning their wheel all around, all around. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And it's just like, no, dude, you don't need to turn your wheel. You know, It's just like have momentum do that in any way. So. Yeah. No, that's that's uh, that's a good tip. Um, uh, so, uh, oh, you know, one of the things that I can't that I found kind of interesting is uh, that I didn't know that there was a big tugboat community. Apparently, 
there are a lot of people who are fans of tugboats um mm-hmm. like the whole communities on facebook and instagram and you know i i know you as you were a, a tugboat captain yourself for some time um what is it about tugboats uh, they're just cool. That's <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, they're just like, they're like the power, you know, they move stuff. Uh-huh. Um, they, you know, they're the tractor trailers basically of the, of the water world and they move giant things. Um, you know, there's nothing comparable really on land, uh, to a tugboat in terms of its power and what it could move on the water and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And, and I, I think there's just, uh, it goes back a long time that, you know, they tow the ships in, they, they move the barges around and, you know, if you, they're just part of the lore. I mean, and it's a, and I should say, and Tim and I talked about this a little bit, it's a great job. It's a really great job to be a tugboat captain. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's there can be some tough hours, uh, but for the most part, you know, it's it varies. But from company to company and contract to contract, but it's essentially 10, 10 days on and 10 days off. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I worked that contract um, back uh, in the early 80s uh, when I was uh, young and didn't know any better. And I was making really good money, um, above average money, money that 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 you could raise a family on kind of money. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I would work 10 days on. And this is a part of my crazy life is I would work on the tugboat 10 days on 10 days off. But the 10 days I had off, I was actually uh, had a play in New York on off off Broadway. So I would I would go and, and you know, I'd have the whole uh, uh, playwright thing going on. And, you know, I have the scarf and <laughs> yeah, very different life, <laughs> totally different life. Right. And then I would do that for 10 days and then, OK, then we go back and I I directed a play like that. And, and then eventually I got a job uh, uh, writing for uh, a couple of local magazines and stuff. And uh, but the the tugboat thing was, you know, that's always my go to. That was my go to um, earn money, you know, yeah. kind of idea. So uh, unfortunately, it's uh, the skills and sets and all the rest of the stuff has changed today. Um, I did post one picture of uh, 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 Madsen. Uh, which is a company that does construction uh, and they've got big tugs, but uh, they're mostly push tugs for barges. They do a lot of dredging. They rebuild bridges. Um, they, uh, they have giant cranes that they move around. Um, it, it's so they're more of a construction tug company as opposed to what, captain tim is doing which is moving um uh lightering barges and bar fuel barges all over the place yeah so yeah one of the one of the things i thought was really interesting about tim is that he's into alternative energy and he's a conservationist which you wouldn't necessarily expect out of somebody who's a, a tugboat captain to be environmentally aware and especially since he's moving all this oil around and dealing with you know, all these sensitive issues, um, I guess it's a good thing that there's somebody like him actually behind the wheel of these boats that are, that, that they're very sensitive to environmental yeah. issues. I, I, I think, I think the thing is, is all boaters need to be sensitive to these areas, to the environment, especially when you're fueling. Um, you know, if you have fuel burp out the side of your air, um, uh, you're going to have fuel in the water and when there's a sheen in the water, that's not good. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, now you can actually put these suction cups on the side of your boat so that the air vent, if it does burp and fuel comes out, it'll go into a cup mm-hmm. like he has. They're putting, they're putting fuel in like 25, 30,000 gallons of fuel for the, for the tugboat. Okay. And it's, it's, going fast it's not like it's going your local uh gas station yeah you're not at the pump (laughs) you're not at the pump with that kind of thing so you know it has it would have a tendency to do it and there's a whole art to doing that whole thing 
And for for everybody that's involved in voting, that is that's a critical thing we have to pay attention to is making sure all of it does nothing gets in the water, stays clean and keeps going. I know I had my boat down in L.A. Harbor and we're going to get into doing a podcast on L.A. Harbor. But um, the mud at the bottom is so polluted that the environmental agency in the harbor is just essentially thrown up their hands <laughs> because there's so much toxicity in the mud. They yeah. said it would it, it, they, it would take thousands of years to scrape the bottom and get that mud. Well, and then I, the question is, is what do you do with it? And right? isn't, isn't the L.A. Harbor like one of the most uh, busiest harbors in the world? In terms yes. of, of goods and services coming through there, if if you it, it's the number one harbor in the world, I think, um, or at least it had been. But if you combine Long Beach and uh, L.A. Harbor together, okay, they're the largest. That's the largest harbor complex in the world. Yeah, especially and, since everything's coming now from China and the Far East, and everything's being manufactured there and then shipped over here. Exactly. Um, Exactly. We're going to get into all of that in another podcast on L.A. Harbor yeah. because pe people don't know this, but the only reason that L.A. Harbor is L.A. Harbor is because when the uh, fur traders back in the uh, early 18th century were coming up the coast and down the coast, if you know the California coast at all or the Oregon coast uh, or the Washington coast, there's not a lot of natural anchorages, okay? There is not – the coast is basically cliffs and waves. That's It's a rough, hard coast. But when you come in, if you have you – know, like San Diego, for example, is a beautiful harbor, natural harbor, okay? Yeah. And, and, of course, you have the Navy there now. But in Los Angeles, the harbor was established because it was just mud, there was just flats of mud, okay? And what happens is they could anchor the boat there. It was protected um, in San Pedro, the mountain in San Pedro. It was protected there. And, and so the ships could sit there and they row back and forth and offload in the mud flats. And that's why it started. And because of that, they could offload right there. The railroad, the Pacific Railroad, built the spur to there and thus began Los Angeles because the rest of it was nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And we all know how important the railroad was to California. So very, yeah. yeah, very important. Yeah. So there's a relationship between the uh, shipping and railroad. That is a very intimate relationship because all the goods that come off a ship have to generally have to go by rail. And especially now that, everything is containerized but back in the day before containers you know it was longshoremen unloading and shoveling and carrying bales of hay and metal and all kinds of things so yeah it's uh it's an interesting it's an interesting thing and i should also mention san francisco as being the other california port oh, natural yeah. Port. yeah yeah so that's uh, a huge port yeah. monterey monterey as well but that was mostly for fishing yeah uh, you know, the Jack London stories all take place right there. In, yeah. In well, the entire West Coast of the U.S. is all about fishing, like Washington, Oregon, all the way up the coast, up into yep. Canada even, um, mm -hmm. all about fishing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> it's neither here nor there. <laughs> um, uh, the, other, the other issue that I wanted to, to talk about and, and – you highlighted this in the episode was talking about the aha moment or, you know, when you, when you have that moment of like, Oh, I could do this, you know? And I think a lot of our listeners and a lot of people watching this, uh, maybe they're thinking about, or they haven't yet pulled the trigger. Um, or you can't obviously because of the, the coronavirus right now, but, um, are planning on, you know, getting out there, getting on a boat, or maybe one day retiring and sailing around the world. Um, what was that aha moment like for you? Well, 
I because I worked on ore boats in high school when I was in high school. I kind of already understood there was a there was a maritime industry that that could be a career choice. Okay, so that in the back of my mind was it wasn't like I was coming from being an accountant and saying, you know, like I I had a friend, my friend Ed, he he was actually a nuclear scientist who gave up being a nuclear scientist and a job at IBM, which was a very good job to uh, to start a charter business in the Caribbean. You know, (laughs) wow. Wow. um, Yeah, it's kind of a different drastic change. Um, but you kind of get to it. I think the thing is, is that if you decide that you're going to go in, the, there's so many aspects of the, of the business. If you decide you're going to go into the, the professional maritime industry, okay, there's a lot of things that you have to work on. There's some licensing that you have to go through. Um, it's a real push to go in that direction. Mm-hmm. And um, you've got to take it seriously. And there's ways you can that are outlined that you could end up being a tugboat captain like Tim, you know, and getting your license and finding your way. It's like we didn't talk about it, but pilots. OK, uh, those are the, the guys that get on the boat outside the harbor and bring it into the slip. OK, now the pilots generally that's not a job anybody can get. That's even if you were qualified, it's hard to get that job because it's all about who you know and there's a strict hierarchy. And in New York, I think there was like one family that were all the pilots for the New York pilots. Yeah. They're all re- they were all related. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of there's that nepotism that takes place within the whole piece. And then um, if you if you're just gonna get on your boat and go cruising that's a different thing. Um, and I talk about that a little bit um, in some of the other podcasts that we have. And I'm going to talk about it more about getting up and leaving. OK, yeah. and that's 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 a tough thing, because a lot of guys, a lot of people over prepare. They, they think like people on land. They have to have this and that, and this and that, and I can't go because of this. And all it is is excuses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A funny, a funny story about getting up and going that I remembered the other day. I was in Trinidad, in the um, clearing in in the and 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 the guy. There's a couple of guys sitting in there, and and this Frenchman walked in. This little skinny, young. French guy, right, with hair all over the place, and you know, he said, "Oh, I'm here to check in," and he didn't speak any English. And I helped a little bit in the translation, and they said, "Well, where did you come from? Where's your boat?" So we all kind of like looked out the door because the office was right on the dock, and we looked down, and there's this little, like, 18 foot trimaran. Okay, literally the center of the 18 foot trimaran is. You could lay in it or sit in it, and that was it. That's all the room you had. And then the, the pontoons, and then it had um, uh, a trampoline across between the three of them. Uh-huh. And we and and they didn't believe. The authorities did not believe that he he came from France. Wow, wow! So he sailed all the way somebody. across the Atlantic in the little ca- trimaran. No, it's worse than that. He went out for a sail. Uh-huh. What I. When we talked afterwards, he went out for a sail one day, okay, and just decided to leave and just he, keep going. And and he went he went all the way down. Um, he literally sailed all the way down to uh, the Canary Islands. Wow, where he bought some food. Okay, <laughs> he didn't. He said I. He said I kind of was planning, but I really wasn't planning to leave. And he said, then I just got the idea. He says, I can cross from here. I can go to the Caribbean, which was his dream. And he did. He, he wow. made it like in 11 days in the wow. trimaran. So he was flying. He was, wow. it's a, so, um, and he got there in Trinidad, and he, did, he had to ask what island it was. <laughs> he didn't even know where he, he was. <laughs> no, he had he he knew it was he kind of had his general i a general idea because uh, but you know if you left from the Azores and you kept going straight you would eventually all he had was a compass he didn't yeah. have any charts or anything Jeez. anyway so that's what I get back to the idea that if you're going to leave a lot of people have left 
without as much preparation as you're thinking of doing. Yeah, absolutely. And and if you're if you're watching this and you haven't listened to it, you can check out. I think it was episode uh, two. Why haven't you left? Yes, uh, which which touches on that that topic as well. Um, and and if you haven't had a chance to go and check out Tim B's YouTube channel, t- it's Tim B at C. That's T I M B A T S E A. Um, he has a great video called "A Day in the Life of a Tugboat Captain in New York Harbor," um, which I would suggest you go and take a look at. Um, he's a great great channel over there on YouTube. Um, I think that's that's it this time. Is there is there anything else you wanted to to discuss or mention about uh, Tim B and your discussion? Seems like uh, you guys had a great discussion. Yeah, just uh, you know, we had one comment that that, that they the the listener enjoyed listening to it. It was like he was a deckhand listening to two old tugboat captains chew the fat. Um, which is true. So I, at some point we're going to have uh, we're going to have Tim back again, and uh, we'll talk about some more uh, rules of the road, and uh, maybe we can get into a little bit more environmental uh, conversation with him. Yes, and and if you listen by now, um, you know you can also listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, um, Stitcher, Deezer. Um, there's radio podcasts, Google podcasts, Spotify. Uh, if you're on Apple podcasts, make sure that you leave a review. If you enjoy what you hear and leave us a a rating, uh, and tell a friend. So (laughs) (laughs) tell a friend, share lots of friends. And, and one last little plug is that, um, if you would all be so kind as to go to our Facebook page, um, and to the Offshore Explorer Facebook page and um, like and follow us. Uh, there's lots of cool information that I put on that page. And, um, you know, it, it'll tell you everything you need to know about uh, what we're doing with Offshore Explorer and our, our future, our future uh, projects. Yes, definitely. We have a lot coming up. So, all right, stay tuned. Have a good weekend, everybody. I'll see you later. Bye, Scott. Bye-bye. Thank you.